In 2003, scholar Henry Louis Gates Jr. helped publish what was thought to be the first novel ever written by an African-American woman. Drawn from a manuscript dating back to the mid-1800s, the book topped the New York Times bestsellers list for months. But a question remained, just who was this author and what could we know about her life? That led Professor Greg Hekimovich on a two-decade journey of discovery, culminating in his new book, the Life and Times of Hannah Crafts. So when it came out in 2002, I read it and I was just blown away. I had to know who wrote this book. Like uh, many scholar, readers, Howard Professor Howard. Greg Hekimovich was among those fascinated by the Bond woman's narrative. We are in Murfreesboro, North Carolina. And so he dove into researching the book, which detailed the life of a mixed-race enslaved woman from North Carolina who had escaped to freedom. Then I saw this 300-plus page holograph manuscript. That original handwritten manuscript went up for auction several years earlier and was bought by Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., host of the PBS TV series, Finding Your Roots. And I thought, bingo. First of all, there are very few handwritten manuscripts for any author from the 19th century. He published it in 2002 with a bold yet unproven theory. Its author, Hannah Crafts, was black. A lot of people didn't think she, no, yeah. she had the capability to write yeah, this, leading the education a, yeah. to write this. So uh, leading American scholars are like, the, an enslaved person could not have gained this literacy. Two decades later, Hekimovich chronicled it all in his own book, The Life and Times of Hannah Crafts. Anna Crafts lived in this house and served college boarders who stayed here. After zeroing in on the small town North Carolina home of her enslaver, John Wheeler. So this is John Wheeler House, built in 1810. This is where Hannah Crafts served the Wheeler family from 1852 to 1856. There are so many clues that you came to learn about. What was the single most compelling piece of evidence for you. Really important was the forensic evidence. The actual stationery itself. 1856 to 1858, this paper was produced around that time. The ink matches it. Well, there's a watermark on the paper. So I found in her enslaver's letters, letters she wrote in 1856 and 1857, that same watermark. Hekimovich studied the handwriting of family members living there but could not find a match. It was an enslaved person in the house during this period, 1856 to 1857, who wrote that novel. So he interviewed descendants on both sides of the household. This was Samuel Jordan Wheeler. Uncovering right previously unseen photographs and documents. They would bring things down from their attic or tell me where to look in other archives. And through this long process, I was able to uncover Hannah Bond, she was born as Hannah Bond, took the name Hannah Crafts, and in this very house began writing this extraordinary novel, the first novel by an African-American woman. One of Hannah's descendants who helped him was Benjamin Speller. It goes to show you, in spite of all of the public policies on what slaves should not do and should not be encouraged to do and should not do scholarship, literacy, they were able uh, to do that. But the key to unlocking Hannah's mastery of literacy, learning that students from a women's college just down the block boarded at the Wheeler home. And there was an extraordinary amount of literature that she read, that she engaged through those w young women. She could see the power of Uncle Tom's Cabin. She could see the brilliance of Charles Dickens, but they weren't telling the story of slavery, the real story of slavery. And so she took those materials and flip the script. A script, Hekimovich says, was autobiographical and included details on how Hannah was trafficked and abused. In this powerful way, what I think she's engaging and something she saw in her life, she's going to take that apart in the novel, demonstrate that this is a sin even deeper than slavery, the sort of sexual abuse that was a part of her life, the life of her mother and her grandmother. This was a very important figure in my research. He's a nephew that lived here. There were stories of allyship, too. When Hannah Crafts was here between 1852 and 1856. So you believe he helped her escape? I do. 
escape, so as she did in the book, by dressing as a man. These stories are so vivid and they read so real. Why didn't she just write a true life, as in Frederick Douglass had, as in a Sojourner Truth, other yes. people who recounted like 12 years a slave? Right. Yeah, she didn't do that because she wasn't writing for a specific audience. It was enough for her, I think, to develop those stories, close the book on those experiences, share it with those she loved in her church community and with her family. No one was more pleased with the findings than Henry Louis Gates Jr. himself. He found Hannah's original name, which was Hannah Bond. He found the name of the abolitionist family, the Kraft family, with whom she found shelter, the freedom in New York and from whom she took her, her surname and a thousand and one other details. It was mind boggling what he found. Which for Gates was no small task. There are people who said it was wishful thinking, that I just wanted to make a claim for the race because I'm a race man and I'm very proud of African American people, but that I pushed it too far. And it turned out I hadn't pushed it far enough. I was more right than I ever dreamed. And that's um, a, a gratifying thing. Gratifying, too, for both men, that Hannah Crafts got the life they believe she deserved. She ended up living into old age, happy in New Jersey. She married a wonderful man. So she had this joyful life because she had this powerful imagination and empathy for other human beings. And that art of living right I've always read the novel as a manual for how to hold faith and, and how to take up challenges and to be joyful and humorous and transcend the horrors of how human beings can treat other human beings. A fascinating read. To really understand what Hekimovich was able to do, he was initially skeptical about, you know, the origins of this book and who actually wrote it. Right. And there was so much criticism of what Gates had like sort of put out there. But the data, the evidence proved him right. And he was so excited that he could help a scholar like Henry Louis Gates. What an incredible, incredible journey there. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. All right, Michelle, thank you. Thank you.